I'm Alok Jha, I'm one of the science correspondents here at The Guardian. Now, in association with the Royal Institution, I'm organising a debate looking at the scientific study of consciousness. We've got three excellent speakers on the bill. There's Anil Seth, he's a neuroscientist at the University of Sussex. Chris Frith, who looks at the psychological aspects of neuroscience at University College London. And philosopher Barry Smith from Birkbeck University. I've brought them together to have a bit of a shoot the breeze session to exchange some ideas and also to record a podcast. So uh, why don't we have a look and see what happens? It's locked. <laughs> In ancient times, was it seen as something special, something inside you that sort of was a life force of some sort? It, it could be seen as something inside you, but they weren't sure quite where. Sometimes it might be in the heart. Uh, it's only in more recent modern times that we've actually located it in the brain. But really, everyone was aware there was something very special about having a mind. Even if we knew everything about how the brain works, how all the neurons interact, how they transform sensory data into actions, how they generate memories, even then we still would not understand why any of these physical operations should be accompanied by subjective experience. Well, let's give a concrete example. case of the famous patient DF. She is unable anymore to recognise objects from their shape. So she couldn't tell you what this is because she doesn't know what shape it is. But she can actually reach out and grasp it perfectly well. So the evidence about its shape is there in the brain and can control her arm movements and finger movements, but she's actually not aware of this. A lot of the autonomous processes in the body we're not aware of and we'd go crazy, to mind the phrase, if we had to control everything uh, consciously. Yeah. So consciousness is just one part of what the brain constructs. Yeah. And I would think it's actually quite a small part. So these days people really try to look at two different things. What's necessary for being conscious at all, say the difference between being asleep and awake or in a coma or anesthesia, something like that, and what's necessary for specific conscious contents, so for example the experience of, a, of an object or the smell of a, of a rose, something like that. And we now think that it's a network of regions in the cortex, which is the crinkled surface of the brain, and the thalamus, which is deep within, that together provide both level and content. And if you have damage to particular parts of the cortex, you may lose the ability to have specific kinds of conscious experience, but you won't lose the ability to be conscious itself. Philosophers who ask what is the physical basis of consciousness, are asking it as if there was one thing we meant by consciousness. But from what Chris has said and Anil has said, there's been a two-way flow between philosophers, neuroscientists and psychologists saying, well, consciousness isn't a single thing. There are different levels of consciousness. There are different things that consciousness might do and different ways it presents. Uh, you can be aware of things in consciousness or just conscious. So once you break it down, you see that there is no single hard problem. In fact, there are many problems. And that's where I think we're beginning to make progress. So what are the scientific limits to our understanding? And can we really examine the system from within? That's what I want to explore in the session.